Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. and welcome to session 17 of principles of management course students i am your instructor dr shikha n khera from delhi school of management delhi technological university we have been discussing about the concept of organizing from past two sessions so today we will be taking up organizing part 3 in organizing part 1 and 2 we tried to highlight the concept and process of organizing in detail Today we shall be taking it for forward with the help of certain concepts which are essential for making organizing a successful phenomenon in the organization. While we say this, it relates to a concept which is called as organization culture. Organization culture cannot be manufactured in factories. It takes long time to the organization to build organization culture and this long time is invested by the top management in terms of integrity and value system to be imbibed in each member of the organization why am i highlighting here the importance of organization culture is that it creates organizational citizenship behavior and along with that adds on to the goodwill and brand image of the organization and the important ingredients to have an extremely success oriented organization culture is appropriate organizing with the help of tools like authority, responsibility, centralization and accountability. So these are the concepts in today's session that we will try to highlight in detail. In general, if I talk about these concepts of authority, responsibility and accountability, they are the premium ingredients for organizing any phenomenon. What is authority? In layman's term, authority is the power which is vested in a position. So with position, I mean that the job position that any person holds. So position can be of a vice president, can be of CEO or can be a manager. These positions have authority that is they are authorized. They have the power to carry out or execute some functions. But along with this authority comes a com concept of responsibility. And what is responsibility? Nothing but the duties which are associated with the particular position. So in order to carry out these duties, an individual needs to be authorized to, to take certain decisions or maybe to utilize certain resources that are available in the organization. Now once the position has accountability and responsibility, Along with this, the position also has answerability. Answerability is the manager or the senior position holder is accountable to give the details of the work performed to his superior or boss. So this flows from bottom up. We have accountability that is bottom up in nature, responsibility that is the duties of the job and authority that is the power which is vested in the position, power to do what? Power to make decisions and power to utilize resources. So students I believe that this explanation must have given you some brief introduction of these concepts of authority, responsibility and accountability. And when we are able to focus on these concepts, we reach to development of a right kind of organization culture. Let us have some detailed conceptual understanding of these concepts 
authority refers to the right to influence the activities of subordinates or to make decisions concerning them and to issue instructions also to the subordinates with respect to the work which is being assigned to them. So, once students the decision on the type of departmentation that we discussed in the previous session and span of management are made which was also discussed in the previous session of organizing. The next stage in organizing is to decide on how much of authority should be given to each person or position in the organization structure. So, this is the magnitude of the power vested in the position and this authority enables independent functioning by the people without reference to their supervisor because they have this power to make the decision. So, managers at the top levels of organization structure are usually entrusted with the maximum authority or more authority than those who are at the middle and the lower levels. And similarly, managers at middle levels will have more authority than the lower level of or supervisory level of people. So, managers are given the authority to make decisions and use organizational resources so as to reach to organization goals and plans. Authority empowers managers to do what is needed in their job. So, generally the assignment of formal authority to the people at lower level of hierarchy for a purpose is called as delegation. So, we call it as delegation of authority. So, what is delegation of authority then students? Delegation of authority is the concept where we give a part of our duty or manager gives part of his duty to the subordinate or maybe he can give the whole task to the subordinate to be completed. So, delegation of authority is essential for developing skills and abilities of the subordinate. Now that we have given a part of duty to subordinate or the whole task to the subordinate, here the subordinate gets an opportunity to groom himself in varied areas. Also, it is an important technique for preparing the lower level managers for higher position. So, we can say that it helps in career planning or maybe succession planning to identify the successor. So, delegation of authority also plays an important role in increasing the productivity of the employees which is one of the most important requirements of any organization. But while delegating managers must ensure that authority is along with appropriate amount of responsibility and accountability that we have discussed a little while ago. So, authority should be equal to responsibility so that the person can perform the task with ease and if somebody is given responsibility for something then he or she must have adequate authority to take the actions needed to achieve the success. Then comes the second concept that is responsibility. As we know responsibility is broadly the duty associated with the job also we can call it as the roles that the person has to carry out while he is performing that job. So, it refers to the obligation or duty to complete the task assigned. Responsibility also may be defined as employees obligation that arises when accepting the managers delegated authority. So, it is the obligation that the employee has to fulfill. It requires employees to perform specific task with the aid of authority entrusted to him and responsibility gives the employees the feeling of usefulness, pride in their work which helps boost the morale of the employee to a larger extent. But it is essential for managers to ensure that subordinates have just enough authority to meet their responsibility because when the subordinate is given responsibility without appropriate authority the result would be job stress 
and frustration among the employees because he is not authorized adequately to complete the responsibilities which was given to him. So, in such a situation it will be taken as more of a burden by the employee rather than a privilege to carry out a particular task. So, on the contrary if too much of authority student is given with too little responsibility then what will happen? It may lead to mall practices and maybe also it may come up with or land up the employee into dangerous situations. So, these things need to be avoided. So, manager must therefore ensure a balance between responsibility and authority, a right kind of blend of authority and responsibility is to be seen. Here we can have an example from an Indian organization which is trying to practice the same concept. It is about the ITC company and their balancing authority and responsibility, how managers are doing it. So, organizations, ITC corporate governance initiative is worth mentioning which talks about it looks to strengthen and refine its corporate governance process and systems by striking the golden balance between executive freedom and the need for effective control and accountability. You can see here one of the largest Indian giants business giant is also following the same concept of authority responsibility balancing. So, the two important principles that ITC is following includes managers must have the executive freedom or what we call as authority to drive the enterprise forward without unnecessary restraints. And the second condition here is the freedom of management should be exercised within the framework of effective accountability. It should not go beyond the required authority. Also ITC believes that creation of a mechanism of checks and balances. You also must be doing checks and balances in your life in order to have a smooth functioning. So, it ensures that decision making powers vested in executive management is not misused for any kind of mal practice and but is used with care and responsibility. This is a very important takeaway students that while we are entrusted by our superiors in the organization, we must value that trust that is being vested with us. Now, the third concept that is answerability or accountability. So, fixation of accountability after the delegation of authority and responsibility is the most important task. Now, the person knows that what is the, what are, what are different duties that I have to perform and what is the power given to me to take the duties. The third thing is that I am answerable to my seniors for whatever they have given me the task and the power they have given. Whether I have as a manager utilized these duties and powers perfectly, accurately or within the given framework or not. So, accountability makes the employees answerable for the satisfactory completion of the task. Accountability is basically a mechanism through which authority and responsibility are brought into alignment with each other. Had answerability not been there, maybe people can you know reduce their effort to complete the duties or maybe they misuse their powers. So, at the time of delegation manager must make certain that each employee knows very clearly what they are accountable for and this will then ensure that employees constantly report and justify the outcomes of their actions to the managers. Moving further, how managers delegate their part of duty, responsibility and authority to their subordinates. So, there is a process of doing it. So, delegation which involves the transfer of formal authority and responsibility is basically a multi-step process. 
and it is one of the difficult task of the managers for because of two reasons one that it is difficult to find the right person whom you think of that i should delegate my part of duty that he should be fit enough to do this job and the second reason is that manager may find hard to share some of their authority with their subordinate because they may be in a fix whether this authority will be utilized appropriately or not so having a right balance between the two is a critical and a tedious task for the manager manager should neither delegate too much of authority to subordinate and neither too little and also through a systematic delegation process we can make certain that authority and responsibility are properly delegated so let us see what is the process of delegation process of delegation students have certain steps involved in it the first step is determining the need for delegation why do i want to delegate a part of my authority to my manager and what are the reasons because of which that is a mandatory requirement so to make delegation beneficial managers must have a clear understanding of their goals first once they know the goals they know why i need to delegate the job to the other person also the process of delegation in other words it will achieve success only if they know well about themselves their subordinates and the organizational environment and the practices so here the question mark is that the manager needs to have a clear picture about what he wants to do how his subordinate is and what are organizational practices and culture after that the person has identified the need because of which the delegation becomes essential the next step is assigning the task and the duties now we have identified the right person for this job so once manager decide task to be delegated in this regard it is essential that these tasks need to be well defined we have identified the tasks and the duties and this is nothing but the answer to why we want to delegate the answer is that these tasks and duties are to be completed so managers should first define these tasks properly and they must also communicate this information clearly to the subordinates to whom the task is to be delegated to the right person and managers also must ensure that sub subordinate has understood it well the right person or subordinate has understood what is to be done and they are aware, aware about if any kind of difficulties are present in doing the task they should get the clarifications at this point in time itself so now we know why we want to delegate the need we also know the tasks and duties to be assigned we move on to transferring the authority for task accomplishment so after tasks are assigned to subordinates here the manager should empower them to carry out the task assigned and fulfill the goals and this requires transfer of adequate authority to the subordinate here authority is necessary for subordinates to make the executive decisions and also to use the organizational resources so all should go in line with each other and the quantum of authority that is important here this quantum of authority to be delegated normally will depend upon the nature of task assigned to the subordinate i hope students you are understanding so we have gone through the first second and third step of delegation of authority now we move on to creating responsibility and accountability so when authority is delegated to subordinate it creates an obligation on the part of the subordinate to complete the task given to them and the subordinate's responsibility to the superior is absolute and cannot be shifted any any under any circumstances so the responsibility makes them 
accountable to the manager for all actions and consequences of all actions because you have given a part of your job to subordinate does not mean that the manager is relieved from accountability accountability finally or ultimately rests with the manager who has delegated it and the last step is follow up through the feedback feedback is essential review document with the help of which we can find out that if there was any gap in the performance or in delivery or utilization of authority so beside measuring the performance of subordinates manager should also get their views on the existing delegation system why so students you can quickly reflect on it so that the manager can think of some kind of improvement if required in the process that can be done so here we have completed the process of delegation let's move further now while we are doing the process of delegation and we are giving the authority to the subordinate the authority this authority can be classified into four categories what are the four categories the first category is ability to inform here the subordinate has to identify the alternatives which he feels are more feasible to complete the task so the obligation here or the authority here is only for information he can only inform the bosses that these are the probable alternatives that may be taken to complete the task the next authority is authority to recommend now here after this process of identification is done and we have multiple alternatives with us the manager is authorized to recommend one of the alternatives which is already suggested so here a little more authority or power to take the decision is given to the subordinate that he can decide on the best alternative he feels and recommend it to the sub superior the third category is authority to report now here not only the subordinate has given the information and recommended also but he can also at the end after identifying the right alternative what the subordinate can do he can only give reporting to the manager that these were the alternatives which were selected and these were the this was the alternative which was these were the identified ones these were the selected ones and after selection it has already been executed also and after execution we are giving you the report of the task done maybe review also and under the total authority which is given to the subordinate here the subordinate is not required essentially to communicate alternatives or the chose decision or even after execution they are not essentially required but in general practice the managers or the subordinates they do give reporting or they do tell to the manager that what exactly they chose and how they executed and what is the report so this is how we know that authority can be in four forms either just to inform you are authorized just only to inform you are authorized to recommend only you are authorized to provide report and you are completely authorized to not only identify the alternatives recommended and process it and eventually execute it and come to the final outcome next is that how can we make this delegation of authority more effective 
by what all means or ways. So, the first way to make delegation of authority more effective is that delegate the whole task rather than a part of it. So, it is advisable that give the whole task that will give a clear know how to the person concerned who has to do the job that what is to be done and how it is to be done and I have all access to resources and I am completely accountable to complete the task. The next way by which we can have effective delegation is selection of right person which plays a very important role. If we do a mistake here and we do not have identified the person with right set of skills or capabilities probably even if he intends to do the job he will not be able to complete it as effective as it is expected. Then comes ensure that authority is equal to responsibility so that the decision making power and resource utilization is done properly. Another tool or we may say that another concept which helps us to have effective delegation of authority is give thorough instructions which is very important. If you give incomplete information to the subordinate he may not do justice with the job assigned to him. Maintain feedback that will help the subordinate to get the gap in performance and hence he can improve. And finally, evaluate and reward performance. After evaluation is done, it is very important that appropriate amount of reward or benefits to be given to the subordinate. What will it do students? It will boost the motivation and morale of the employees. So, if any manager follow, follows these instructions while delegating the authority, it is expected that the result is going to be highly beneficial. So, now we move on further to understand the types of delegation process that is existent. Under the types of delegation we have first as general versus specific delegation. In general delegation the subordinates are given the authority to do all activities of the department while they seek general guidelines from the managers. In specific delegation on the other hand the authority given to the subordinate is limited to the performance of certain specific functions only. And specific delegation is usually well defined and task based. So, this is for a particular task and this is in general for all activities. Next is formal versus informal delegation. Now, under formal versus informal delegation, while the delegation confirms to a well defined line of command and control, when we, there we say it is formal delegation and it is normally written and the authority is formal in nature. So, everybody knows what is the rule or the guideline to follow. But in contrast to it when the delegation is not formal and it is informal in nature it may not be written and it is orally conveyed to the delegate or to the subordinate in an informal manner. So, this type of usually uh, this type of delegation usually does not conform to any kind of existing norms or established organization structure. Then comes conditional versus unconditional delegation. So, under this authority is delegated without any precondition as the term itself suggests us that there is no precondition then it is unconditional authority while in conditional authority subordinates are expected to get their decisions approved by their managers. 
when it comes to next that is simple versus complex when the subordinate is given authority to perform what they are presently doing is called as simple delegation so whatever they are doing in routine that is being executed and thus they call it as simple delegation while they are responsible for their existing jobs in this case but in contrast to this when it comes to complex delegation the managers delegate a part of their own job to the subordinate and give the authority only equivalent to that case so in this case the subordinate may get some new task to perform which he was not performing the one he was performing is in simple delegation after this comes the direct versus indirect delegation so when no third person is involved so in category there is a third person involved and in the category of direct no third person is involved we call it as a direct delegation and when third person is involved we call it as a indirect delegation and finally we have sideward downward and outward delegation when managers or superior assign task and delegate authority to their immediate sub subordinate it is called as downward when subordinate transfers some of their duties and authorities to other subordinates of same rank it is called as sideways so and when authority is delegated to someone outside the organization it is normally called as outward delegation so an example for outward delegation will be when the authority to recruit certain category of employees given to some external agency now that authority given to him is outward delegation now apart from the types of delegations that we have discussed there are three more delegation types so this is time bound delegation group delegation and redelegatable delegation when students the delegation to the subordinate is based on timeline maybe for few hours weeks months or years that is called as a time bound delegation when we give task not only to one single individual but also to multiple people or a group together to complete the task in given framework and resources equal authority and responsibility is delegated to them along with accountability it is called as group delegation and redelegatable delegation is when subordinates are given the right to redelegate their delegated task further and authorize it to the other people they have received the amount of responsibility from their sub superiors and they further can give that responsibility to other subordinates or maybe sidewards or downwards or maybe outside that is outward uh, delegation can be done then it is called as redelegatable delegation so by now we have understood the concepts of authority responsibility and delegation let us see now co some concepts of centralization decentralization and other related concepts so before we move on to centralization and decentralization let's have discussion on certain challenges that the concept of delegation has it seems very easy that the manager has delegated the authority to subordinate and then subordinates is, subordinates are very much happy and ready to receive all those uh, uh delig all those task assignments will complete them diligently within the given framework time of time and resources but that's not so easy as it looks the first thing that comes as a challenge to delegation is absence of confidence in the subordinate the confidence on the part of the manager itself he may feel that the person concerned is not well equipped or he doesn't have that zeal to complete that particular task so in that case there is a possibility that delegation process is not properly assigned or completed in a right manner 
then second is fear of comparison so managers may dis inclined to delegate the task because when they fear that their subordinate could outshine them now this can be a competitive spirit or maybe a feeling of fear that the subordinate when given this task because the manager may be aware of that my subordinate has better skills than me from inside he knows that fact so while delegating he may have that fear that the subordinate may outshine him then the third challenge can be refusal by the subordinate subordinates may also refuse to take up the task that is being delegated to the uh, to them for instance they may fear some kind of victimization by their managers maybe for if they fail in the achievement of their goal so with this fear in mind they may not take up the responsibility altogether and also some subordinates may view delegation as a pretext for managers to lighten their work and burden so in that case subordinate will not take up the responsibility because he feels that my boss is giving his part of work his part of job or work to me why should i do that i am already overburdened with my work and then comes lastly difficulties in justifying the surplus time so what do we mean here the top management will normally agree to delegation process of managers only if they can convince their higher authorities about the need for such delegation this is what we have already discussed in the process of delegation that we have to identify the need first so this is a challenge itself to justify as yes, that there is a need and in this regard the manager may find it difficult to actually justify the surplus time available for delegation so this is because the top management will expect the manager to prove that the spare time could be more productive for promoting the organizational interest who will get this surplus time the manager because if manager delegates a part of his responsibility to subordinate so that means he gets some surplus time for himself and he has to justify this surplus time to top management that he will utilize productively and for betterment of the organization now two more important concepts under this frame are centralization versus decentralization of the authority in layman's terms students what these two term mean centralization and decentralization centralization means having authority vested at a central place decentralization means that we have given or empowered the subordinates to take decisions at their own unit level division level department level or subsidiary level so depending on organization size complexity external environment capability of the manager it is then decided by the organization heads that they whether they should go for centralization or they they, they should go for decentralization of decision making or authority let us look into this concept of centralization of authority so in centralization top managers delegate little amount of authority to middle or lower managers in the organization so they keep all authority with themselves preferably and organizations with an efficient and speedy communication system may favor centralized decision making why students because they know that we already have processes in place and our communication pattern is also good so even if we are centralized we will be quickly able to disseminate the information and discuss the course of action with other units or divisions or departments so they may not require the the authority to be decentralization so this system is better suited for organization which has fewer qualified and experienced people at lower levels and this method is necessary when organization decisions are very so this method is necessary when the organization decisions are crucial and the risk of loss is very hi this is very important factor so because risk of loss and the other decisions are very sensitive or information is very sensitive then centralization of authority has to be kept by the top management so let us discuss few limitations and benefits of centralization of uh, decision making if we are going for centralization of decision making it enables the top management to directly plan and implement the important organizational activities they do not need any intervention from any subordinate or manager it helps the organization to protect themselves from risk risk and 
cost because if they go for decentralization probably they may have to go for investment of high amount in terms of having more managers which are capable and have the competence to take decisions. So, the expenditure of their uh, CTC or salaries will be cost incurring to the organization and risky also if they do not have the right kind of capability to take effective decisions. Centralization also ensures that there is uniformity of policies and practices in the organization. This uniformity of policies and practices ensures and enables the organization to have a common, have a, have a movement towards common goal achievement. Then limitations to centralization may include that it forces the senior manager at the top to spend their time on matters that can easily be dealt by managers at lower levels. So, here time loss is one of the greater limitations for centralization. Also, it may not permit the organization to know and utilize the expertise available at the lower level of the manager because they are focusing on centralization, they will not even explore this option of delegating their authority of decision making downwards. It can also curb the individual initiatives and innovations because only a specific team of people are taking the decisions. So, creativity may be missing from if we go for centralization. It can demoralize the people at lower level as they may not have a job autonomy and they may have a feeling that we are only here for operative works rather than for any kind of effective decision making. Moving on, uh, now that we have discussed about the centralization of authority, let us see and have some information on decentralization. So, what is decentralization? When the decision making authority is delegated to the people at the lower level of the organization structure, it shows the management preference for decentralization or bottom up management style. Under bottom up management style, the lower level manager will take the decision and will implement it and that will be communicated to the top management. Since middle and lower managers are empowered to make decisions in decentralized setup, the top manager now will have fewer staff as advisors. And also the top manager can spend good amount of time in strategizing further for organizational growth. So, the benefits of this decentralization may include fast and timely decisions to capitalize the market opportunities very effectively which are available in the outside environment of business. Here since decentralization is taken at the subsidiary unit or business uh, division and department unit, so local expertise available with manager at lower level of organization structure is put at the best use which can give them high morale motivation, enhance or give them opportunity to groom themselves also. And the grassroots levels to directly deal with customers, employees, competitors and markets to make decision is done with the help of decentralized authority because here the manager is in directly touch with the customers or can understand the pleas of employees well and hence can take up the right kind of decisions. As we have benefits, so certain limitations also of decentralization. So, to adopt a consistent, uniform and unified approach towards decision making process across the organization can be a little difficult when we go for decentralization. Also to make decisions that may serve their departmental interest, but not the overall organizational interest. So, manager here can focus more on the departmental interest than on organizational interest. The manager may have too much importance for issue in their immediate surroundings while ignoring the large organizational issues. So, these limitations can be a deterring factor for the uh, organization to think towards having decentralization in the organization. Now, as I mentioned that well, whether the organization will go for centralization or decentralization, it will depend on multiple factors. So, let us see that to what extent the decentralization in, organ, uh, in organizations take place. So, according to a scientist Warren R. Plunkett, the degree of decentralization is normally high in the organization where large number of decisions and critical decisions are allowed to be taken at lower level in organizational hierarchy. So, if that is the case, then degree of decentralization is high. 
the organizational policies offer adequate operational flexibility to employees at lower level in this case also degree of decentralization is high and they may have a freedom to interpret the policies differently depending on the situation in that case also the degree of decentralization is very high so for example organization may permit the employees dealing with customer grievances to be more prudent towards their procedures in setting their settling their grievances and in this case subordinates need to consult their managers less number of times and only before any decisions are to be made so the these are the reasons which prompt the organization to go for decentralization also if the organization is dispersed across the globe in that scenario also degree of decentralization is higher so centralization or decentralization is basically very relative concept to each other so while deciding whether to centralize or whether to decentralize the decision making authority management must consider the factors that favor centralization or decentralization because there is no single method that can be that is method here means centralization or decentralization who works well for all types of organization organizational independent characteristics play a major role so it is hence essential for management to consider the suitability of either of the th uh, two methods based on the prevailing conditions before they choose any specific method whether centralization or decentralization so managements typically execute their decentralization plans through job designs which is an important factor to consider now students that we have discussed about various concepts which help in organizing that is we started off with authority accountability responsibility and then went on to centralization and decentralization all these phenomenon if are properly in place we know the right person for delegation we know the right task for delegation we know why we are going for centralization the conditions are prompting us to go for decentralization and so forth and we have right amount of accountability we are very much in a sound situation for the organizing function of management this organizing function of management then further extends to the type of organization we have or the organization structure we have so broadly there are many kinds of organization structures but broadly they are categorized into three categories we have line organizations line and staff organizations and committee organizations if we try to explain this in general terms before i go on to the uh, details which are conceptually written by the authors the line organization is which is hierarchical in nature so one after the other in a vertical line the line uh, organization takes place where the reporting relationship is from bottom to top so the lower manager will report to middle the middle will report to the top that is the line organization the main focus of line organization is to carry out all administrative tasks and along with that take the strategic decisions at the top positions but in addition to this line there is another organization which is called as staff uh, organization structure under staff organization structure we have specialist people assisting to perform various functional areas of management so they help the line managers to take up right kind of decisions while they are going ahead with the decision making in organization and the third kind of organization is the committee organization where together a group of people are formed in different types of committees which enable the organization to take up the assignments based on their specialized areas so let us dig into detail theoretically what are the concepts of these three types of organizations so as i mentioned line organizations are also called doing organizations where all activities from the production to marketing of goods are controlled by the managers and the owners and in this case of companies of line authority managers maintain direct control over all activities carried out in their respective departments they are also directly responsible for achieving the organizational goals and 
plans here you are able to see that the manager is responsible for everything that is being performed thus it is called as doing organization authority will be greatest in line organization at the top level and then gets gradually reduced with each successive level of the hierarchy and the authority of manager in line organization is primarily legitimate and formal so line organization as i mentioned earlier it is a vertical hierarchical structure in which we have multiple levels and for each level here the authority is greatest while here it is lowest then comes the second type of organization that is line and staff organization it is in which the line manager gets advice and assistance from the staff manager which is also called as an advisor and this kind of organization includes both line and staff positions in the structure i'll just let you know what are line and staff positions in the structure so here the large and more complex organizations normally prefer line staff setup to improve their quality of managerial decisions now what is line and staff organization so this is students line organization for example this position is ceo this is managing director vice president general manager and manager so they are the ones who take up all decision making for the organization and here we have certain staff functions also and what are the staff functions we may have vice president hr vice president finance vice president marketing vice president productions vice president supply chain management and vice president maybe materials management or maybe some other functional area so what is the job of this they are the staff functions and what is the job of the staff function to give advice to the main lead in the organization who is taking care of general administration and improve the processes so this is the structure for line and staff organization staff students always remember staff is the specialist so this can also be like if vice president hr is there further this can be divided into for further categories manager training and development manager recruitment and selection manager for orientation and placement of the employees or maybe manager for compensation management etc so they are all staff functions or advisors so we have uh, an uh, an example also here which depicts the pictorial depiction of a line and staff here you can see th this is the this is the line first second level then third level then third level fourth level and fifth level so these are this is the line of authority and this is the line organization and this is the staff organization the third category of organization is committee organization so when group of individuals are given the authority and responsibility to necessarily perform the activities or certain tasks for making decisions on certain matters it is called as committee organization so development of what kind of work this committee organization is given they are also cross functional organization or you can say cross functional committee in an organization so the first task that they may be uh, uh, assigned with or the committee organization is formed for reason can be development of a new product or may be resolving the problem of high rejection rate in production so this is a very typical problem then comes fixation of revised pay for employees then identification of causes for declining sales these are the few reasons for which committees can be formed here the committee members are taken from very different areas of the organization they may be expert in their area and may have the capacity to give some insights for better 
परफॉर्मेंस और मे बी फॉर बेटर एग्जीक्यूशन ऑफ और रेजोल्यूशन ऑफ एनी काइंड ऑफ प्रॉब्लम विच इज अकरिंग दिस इज अ स्ट्रक्चर फॉर कमिटी ऑर्गेनाइजेशन मैनेजमेंट रिव्यू बोर्ड आई एस ओ नाइन थाउजेंड मैनेजमेंट रिप्रेजेंटेटिव सो दिस इज अ क्वालिटी एश्योरेंस पैरामीटर हेयर दे हैव एन एडवाइजर हु इज अ स्पेशलिस्ट प्रॉबेबली and the committee can be taken from the various departments so these members together form a committee in the organization to resolve a particular issue or challenge or maybe for to encash some new opportunity which is there in the market and finally the last kind of organization that we should discuss is the matrix organization matrix structure we also discussed in the previous session while we were discussing about various forms in organizing uh, or in departmentalization so different departments one of the department was matrix department also in matrix organization here we have people who are from different ranks also and different chain of command as well so when we go for different ranks so that means someone can be manager or vice president and this is in chain of command and when we talk about different chain of commands altogether so it can be someone who is into the product development chain and and someone can be into the administrative chain so let us try to understand it matrix organization is usually formed when employees from different functional departments are required collectively for execution of the project and in matrix organization each member should report to the manager of cross functional project as well as the manager of the functional department that is deputed for that particular project there is a structure of matrix organization where we can have different projects of organization going together and different functional departments who are participating for carrying out the all work for a particular project for project a all these functional departments are carrying out work and similarly for the other project and for the third project as well so this is called as matrix organization in formal organization all organizations that we talked about were the formal organizations till now so there is another form of organization which is informal which is not governed by any formal regulatory authority no formal guidelines no written rules for it but they do exist in organization and they do serve some purpose so what is that the informal working relationship exist amongst organizational members that is you have friendship groups you have common interest groups or you have groups because you belong to the same department but these groups are not uh, accounted for any kind of specific work they are binded with each other because of the formal positioning they holds but otherwise they have some informal connection or informal connect with each other so the purpose of existence of informal organization is to fulfill the common needs of group and their members so this common need as i mentioned can be common interest maybe you all have interest in yoga so uh, out of 10 members in your department three members have interest in yoga so they may form a common group or what we call as informal organization so the behavior of members of formal organization is guided by hierarchy of authority rules procedures regulations etc but in contrast the behavior of members of informal organization is lightly largely guided by official norms sentiments rituals common interest and personality of people who have common interest or maybe because of common work that they do so this is informal organization so students this is all from my side for organizing chapter and we have tried to have a detailed discussion on all the aspects of organizing starting from concepts like principles of organizing process of organizing moving on to the various divisions departmentalization in organization span of management and control then today we discussed on accountability decentralization centralization and delegation of authority and responsibility and i think with this you will be in a position to also utilize this knowledge to tomorrow execute your managerial function well when you are placed in the organization 
so this is the bibliography students which i have referred for this particular session you also may look into these books to have a clearer and better understanding of concepts in case you wish to this is all from my side and i conclude this session thank you